This is Weights and Wealth, your one-stop shop for entertaining education on building a stronger body and bank account. We are not doctors or financial advisors, and must warn you, this is not medical or investing advice. It is for your entertainment. Welcome back to Weights and Wealth. Here with us today, we have Paul Bach. And Paul was a Green Beret for how many years? Uh, so I graduated the key course in 07, April, and then I retired in February. It was medical, but uh, February of uh, 19. So 12 years? Yeah, about, about 12 there, 12 years. Awesome. And Paul is the author of Onslaught of Ecclesia. It's a Christian manifesto, would you say? Yeah, so the reason I called it a manifesto is just due to the fact of more like, hey, this is me declaring what we really should be doing as Christians. And the general premise, it's kind of set up like an AAR. Uh, what's our initial problem, right? Here's the situation. Let's be honest about what's going on, where we're at as the church. And then what are we called to in Christ if we're going to claim him? Uh, dealing with evangelism, dealing with the pursuit of scripture, dealing with um, the reality of, is scripture true? Should we take it as seriously as it? We, some people try to say it should be taken, or is it just metaphorical, ah, you know, good life, all that stuff. How seriously should we take scripture, um, worship, and then what are we ultimately called to in this pursuit of being a Christian, glorifying him, walking that out daily, and then what are the consequences not for the non-believer, but for the Christian, what the Christian judgment and how we as believers are going to stand before the beam seat of Christ. And it's going to, based on everything that kind of was talked about in the book, whether we do it, don't do it, follow through, we're either going to have inheritance and reward or we're going to lose out. Mm -hmm. So back to the beginning of that, Paul mentioned AAR. That's after action review for our non-military yeah. peoples. <laughs> um, so an AAR is going to help us identify things we did right, but more importantly, things we did wrong, how we can improve, how we can get better on the next rep. So um, as far as being an AAR, um, Nick and I have talked, we did one episode with Pastor Brandon uh, really early on. And in that we talked about this progressive Christianity that is consuming uh, a portion of the Protestant and non-denominational churches. And I think um, an AAR in terms of how you interact with others when you're trying to spread the word is important because a lot of times I think when we're trying to disciple others and spread the word of Jesus, we want to put the kid gloves on because we want to welcome as many people in as we can. But I think if you look at your interactions with others that you're trying to bring into the church, that might not be the best approach because if you only lead them in with like Jesus is love and the most important thing is to love others, you might bring them in and then they might kind of go down the road of that progressive Christianity. So it might be better to start with like in your book where you go through the Bible and you take out some of these points and you go through some of the scripture and how it's specific and specific for a reason. And it's not all just symbols. Like there's specific passages and they mean what they say. Right. And that, so that's kind of the golden rule of biblical interpretation. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. Therefore take every, every word as its primary literal meaning in light uh, in, unless the facts of the immediate context dictate otherwise, right? And obviously that's also in light of studying related passages. And so basically the text is going to say what it's going to say. God is serious about what he's spoken. I think it can be demonstrated biblically that mul through multiple proofs that God is serious and literal when he speaks. So for example, um, Psalm 22 gives a first person description of the crucifixion to include what occurs internally when the Messiah dies. It then goes on to state that the world's going to remember this event, which was the crucifixion, even though it doesn't say crucifixion, and turn and worship the God of Israel. Daniel 9 gives when the Messiah is going to come down to the day. And there's a whole, uh, I actually have a whole thing on that. Um, not in the book necessarily, I just have the dates. But Daniel 9 states when the Messiah is going to present himself, he's going to be killed, and after he's killed, the city is going to be destroyed. Zechariah 9 states that the Messiah is going to present himself riding on a donkey. So Luke 19, Jesus shows up. He ends up, you know, he rides in on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9, 9. And the Pharisees say, the, his followers are singing, uh, 
Psalm 118, basically. Well, the Pharisees say something interesting. They say, Master, rebuke your disciples. Well, they understood that by him, his followers, singing, or, uh, singing that song at that time, under those conditions of him riding on the donkey, they were declaring him the Messiah of Israel. That's why they call him to rebuke them. Mm -hmm. Well, the nation doesn't accept him. And he says something very interesting. He says, if you had known in this your day the things which belong to your peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come about you when your enemy will cross the trench about you, surround you in on every side, and lay you want not one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. So he declares corporate blindness over the nation of Israel, so they can't see him as the Messiah. Individually they can, but as a nation, right, they're kind of blinded and hardened. Two, he declares the 70 AD judgment of Rome, of Rome um, on the nation. But why? He says, because if you had known in this your day, he held them accountable to know Daniel 9. And so are we as Christians going to think that we're going to be held any less accountable for not taking seriously the things that he has stated? Now, going back to what you said regarding um, evangelism and, and bringing people into the church, and I think that that right there um, is, is an idea that kind of goes along and helps feed into the progression of Christianity and the idea of how, I would say, people say how we do church and this and that, but really it gets down to the problem of, Church is meant for the believer. Like people can come to church, and you know, I think it's important to share the gospel at church and then for the gospel message to be preached. However, the gathering of believers is for equipping of the saints, right? We see that he gave some apostles, some prophets, and pastors, teachers, evangelists for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. The goal of leadership is not to do the ministry themselves. Yes, they will do ministry, they'll disciple, they'll train others, they will evangelize at times, but Really, that those leadership positions are to be equipping the body so that they can go out and do the ministry. I, I met with a pastor recently, and he was saying, you know, based on his models and the research, because he's looking to start a church, that most of the people coming to Christ come to church, come to Christ in the church, and so we need to set this up like that. And it's like, well, let's take a step back for a second. The reason that most people come to Christ in the church is because Christians are not out evangelizing. They're not sharing their faith. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the numbers of discipleship, right, uh, Christians training other Christians, the numbers are staggering. There, there are a very small number of people actually discipling and being discipled. Um, when it comes to evangelism and what you said earlier, you know, we definitely need to preach the love of Christ, right? It's, it's very important. It, that is key. You know, for God so loved the world. He loved it, and God is love. Um, but we also need to say what it's going to cost them if they don't accept Christ. That's the other side of the coin. You know, in, in Ezekiel 13, um, I believe it's Ezekiel 13, Ezekiel 3, God through Ezekiel said, if I say to you to warn the wicked man, hey, you will die in your wicked ways, and you do not warn him, I will require his blood of you. This, now, the, now, I want us to think about this, because for Paul in Acts 20, Paul says, I am free from the blood of all men. Right? He's, he's saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders. He's not going to see them again. And as he's going through this process, he talks, he says, I'm free from the blood of all men. Well, it's interesting because we know that he was consenting to Stephen's death. He was overseeing the imprisonment and most likely execution of Christ, um, Jews that had become Christian. But yet he says, I'm free from the blood of all men. He says, for I have not, I have not uh, hindered myself from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He was looking back to Ezekiel, that warning, saying, I'm free from the blood of all men because I preached everything to you. I shared all truth with you. I shared the gospel. I withheld nothing from you. So I'm free from blood because I warned you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, getting, yeah. getting into um, teaching other Christians and discipling others outside of the church, that's actually how I met Paul. So... For those of you really cool. that watched the episode with Ricky on homesteading, I'm not sure what episode it was. Something like 38 or 40. Mm -hmm. It was back then around there. Um, but I met Ricky and Paul at the same time in a coffee shop on a Monday morning. Um, and I basically heard them with their Bibles open talking about the Bible. And I just went over and became part of their conversation. <laughs> that was really cool. <laughs> We realized that um, I was going to the same church that they go to, and um, at that point, I think 
you had just met Ricky three weeks prior, and he had just started going to church as well with so you. He had he'd been going to church a little bit, but he actually fully we had he raised his hand to give his life to Christ, okay. and just talking through it, he's like, yeah, I, I totally believe, like yeah, and then he gave his life to Christ. That was really really exciting, obviously, because mm-hmm. anytime somebody comes to Christ, that's that's yeah. just awesome. And so then yeah, just grabbed him up. We had a lot in common, a lot of thoughts on the think a lot of the same things about a lot of different topics uh, and so um, birds of a feather and we just started uh, getting together and just she teaching him this, the Bible and train him as much as I can obviously summer can get a little crazy here and there um, picking that back up him and then what was cool was right after that we met you he was out fishing mm-hmm. and he met this dude John and now John is coming and we've got this whole group of dudes and, and, and he goes to awaken and it just, you know, there's all these connections. And it's like, how could, you know, God just brings people together. It's, it's pretty crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, like what, like one of the ways that I like, like to try to evangelize is mostly just kind of like how you guys all met was just throughout like my dad, like my daily life, just by like chatting with people yeah. and also setting a good example and just leading like a good life because it kind of naturally brings people to ask you why you're living like that yeah. and then it just kind of draws them in yeah you know, that's so. you know it, it says go and preach the gospel to all creatures in mark 16 and with that you know like you said some people tend to tend to think that oh I, i've got to be on the street corner or whatever or i can't do that and that's what comes to their mind right mm-hmm. and it's just like you said really evangelism takes place in those relationships as you build them. And obviously you can't stand on your desk in, in your building and just like, start preaching the gospel, right? You need to get down to the building. But you gotta approach it from a warfare standpoint and a more clandestine nature. Like, hey, I'm, I'm kind of more running clandestine operations here where I'm looking for those opportunities mm-hmm. to where I can plant a seed, right? And, right. and that's the whole thing is like, um, in 1 Corinthians 3, we aren't responsible for conversion. Our job is to sow seed in waters. Paul said, I planted a Paul's water but God gave the increase. So that he that plants is nothing, and he that waters is nothing, but God gives the increase. But each one receives a reward based on their work. And so the important thing for us is to always be ready and prepped and in that place with the Spirit, you know, which requires us daily to be on our faces sucking carpet so that we can be filled with His Spirit and just filled with Him and be really in tune in His Word. And so when those opportunities arise, man, we can just lock, lock on it and just plant that seed, put a little water in there, and, and be ready to have those conversations. Because that's, like you said, that's that's when that stuff really takes place. And that's when it's really powerful because you've got that that trust that's built where at that point they should know, hey, it's not about him being right, me being wrong, and that's, he's not thinking, he's like, he's thinking, hey, he cares about me, mm-hmm. and that's why he's sharing this with me. Mm-hmm. That perfectly sets up something that you and I have talked about before. Um, so. Before we lead into that, can you just tell uh, the people what the Green Beret mission set is? Yeah, I mean, so Green Beret mission sets, we run a lot of different missions, foreign internal defense, uh, direct action, but people tend to think of like, you know, oh, special forces, go kick doors in. That's that's like this tiny little bit of what we do. You know, our bread and butter really is unconventional warfare and training. Um, within unconventional warfare, basically what you do is you it, it kind of looks different with what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I've got the definition here, and it's really kind of how I look at I look at ministry, and it's really how we should be doing it. I always I always like to say Jesus was a green beret, right? He had a team of twelve dudes. He trained them. They went out and they forced multiplied. He sent them out in pairs. Force yeah, multiplier. Yeah, yeah, he's a force multiplier, man. And and, and that that I mean, when you look at what the how it works, so. Uh, Joint doctrine defines unconventional warfare as activities conducted to enable a, resi- a resistance movement or insurgency to coerce, disrupt, or overthrow a government or occupying power by operating through or with an underground, an auxiliary, and guerrilla force in a denied area. Well, I mean, that's basically what we're doing, right? Now, we're not going to overthrow. That's Jesus, ultimately. And then the auxiliary is your support network. And so we've got those that run support for people within the church. They're praying. They're giving, they're helping equip. Uh, then you've got your underground, that's more your more clandestine, more secretive people, right? You could say like if you in a corporate America, you're more on the underground because 
you, even though you're there, you can't openly like all the time, boom, 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 uh, share Christ. And, but those conversations will come. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your guerrilla force and that's your more, obviously more overt, uh, but you're all running those operations. But within the phases of UW and unconventional warfare, uh, it's so cool with, within the phases is once you hit like phase, I think it's four. Uh, yep. So phase four is where you organize, train, and equip resistance cadre. Now, now this is the thing that's so so key to this when you come, look at uh, phases of UW. Okay, you as a uh, captain, you, you're first lieutenant. First lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. I'm trying to. I try to. I thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> try to promote you. Um, but um, so basically, like, if I take you and I train you, go kick this door down. Right. Okay. Now I have a guy that can kick a door down. Cool. But if I take you and I say, all right, I'm going to train you how to train others in these things. Now I've got you and I'm going to take you, I'm going to train you to go kick doors down, train, not just to kick doors, but I'm going to train you how to train others to do this, things to look for, how to train them. Cause there's a difference between how you do this versus how to actually train other people. Mm -hmm. Now I've got two cells and I've got at least anywhere from six to 20 people possibly that now can kick doors in and do stuff. You know, and so it's like cancer cells. And that's where our real strength is, is the training, the ability to train others and train them to be leaders and train other people. That's why UW is so successful when carried out correctly. And with those things in mindset, you're thinking force multiplication, third and fourth order effects. And so Jesus, I mean, heck, he came, he took his team of 12, 12 dudes. We got Dream Rays, teams of, up, slot, slot in front of 12. I had one team, it was only six of us, but hey, it was still a good time. Um, and he took those 12, trained them in everything that he could. And then what they do, they went out and established a bunch of bases, basically. Like Some little, little out place. Yeah. Well, and, and after he left, they went and they, they were training others and training yeah. others. And you see Paul equipping and training. Um, Paul to Timothy, he says, the things which you heard, entrust these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So Paul followed suit. He was a Green Beret in the same sense. You know, it's that idea a force multiplication of, of not just being a dude that goes and listens and consumes. Okay, I go and I go home and do this thing and it's cool. It's no, this is this is a lifestyle. This is a who we are as Christians. We need to be constantly thinking force multiplication because there's two kingdoms right now, right? That are that war with one another, the kingdom of God and Satan's kingdom, the God of this, the God of this age. And we ultimately know who the who's gonna be the victor and who's gonna rule on this earth. But right now, we, we are not the occupying power. You know what I mean? And so our job is to carry out the Great Commission in any way possible, you know, whether, it, and that's preach the gospel, disciple the nations. You know, people in the translations, it says make disciples, but that word make is not in the Greek. Mm -hmm. It's disciple the nations, train, teach. That's what we are to be doing. And everything that we do should be in support of that mission statement. In your book, uh, I think it's in the beginning, but there's a part of the book that says, uh, it talks about these underground Chinese churches, and then it says, go type this link into YouTube and watch this five minute video. Oh man. <laughs> but uh, essentially, we can, we can post the link in the show notes to that video, um, but it's a very cool video, it's pretty short, but it shows how these groups of people in China are meeting, these Christians, and there's like hundreds of them meeting in these underground locations, just worshiping for like eight hours at a time and how they're trying to get Bibles into all these people's hands, but it's heavily restricted by the government. Um, but that, that goes right back to it is training others and then having them train other people and trying to get the word out to people um, just as, as best you can. I think that goes to the question of hunger. You know, one of those things is as you watch that video, that, and it, it still convicts me. I, I can't make it through that video without getting emotional because for me, I see that and I see hunger. I see people that understand the reality of what it really means to be a Christian. I've had this discussion with a couple people. I'm sure you know you guys will understand this. So we meet at 4.30 in the morning, 5 in the morning sometimes over at church just to pray, worship, whatever. Why? Because it, why not? It's a time that we know everybody's not working. There's not stuff scheduled. But we make these excuses as, well, why aren't we doing that? Why, why aren't we getting it? Why do we get together Sunday? Maybe a Wednesday. We meet for an hour, hour and a half maybe. But why is that it? 
why doesn't it go beyond? And then you'll maybe have a small group, sometimes people do, you know, for an hour, hour and a half, maybe two, depending. But really when we're coming together just to pray, worship, talk, bear one another's burdens, and just spend that time before the Lord. You know, these this one in that video, this one church meets two hours every day, four thirty in the morning to six thirty every day in a cave to pray and worship and hear the word. That's hunger. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry, I can't and these dudes they're out working the fields. The work and labor that we do, and you know they're malnourished, their their life is way harder than ours, and yet they still make time to go see Christ and come together and worship and pray. That one church that you talk about, it's 120 degrees in the building, they are going nuts for 12 hours straight. Yeah. There's hunger there. It's it's an understanding of who God is and what it cost him for us to be brought into relationship with him. And I see that, and I look at us, and I look at myself, too, and I'm just like, I don't see this. I don't, like, there has to be something that's missing here that we are not seeing, that they are seeing. And I think that part of that is, again, the persecution. It costs them. They realize, you know, for them, it's, it's very real. For us, it doesn't cost us anything. It's just like overseas, right? You're out, and my buddy John Farmer, it's Great, great dude. I went to basic with him. I uh, went through SOPSI, went through the whole qualification course with him. He, we got to fifth group. We separated ways. That dude is, he gave the best talks and he was a freaking giant man. Um, but they were over in Syria. And every time they went to this one area, they walked over to, uh, they'd go to the same restaurant, it, like clockwork. What'd you do? You set a pattern in life. You got comfortable. Then you got complacent. And what happened? Dude walked up in the middle of him, just clacked himself off, killed John Farmer, killed Chief Kent's wife. I mean, and just one little one little thing, right? And for us as Christians, I think it's too easy to get a little uncomfortable. Life's decent. Even if things are kind of difficult, you know, I'm, you know, I know it's kind of a cliche, but oh, when things get hard, we seek Christ. But really, we go to him for help, but at the same time, it's like, man, we, we have a relationship with the God of the universe who withheld nothing for us. So why would we withhold anything from him? And why would I not just want to, as much as possible, be with the people that are that are his body and his family and his children to sit together and just worship and glorify and honor him? And again, it goes back to well, my schedule and this and that. Man, screw your schedule. Like, and screw my schedule. Like, I, I get it, but at what point do we say, are we really hungry for Christ? Do we really just want him? And then what does that look like in the day-to-day? -day? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's definitely easy to let life kind of take over. Um, so what so what would you kind of like tell people who are starting to get complacent? Because I mean, that, that, that happens to me sometimes. Yeah. And I do turn to God when I need him, when I'm not doing well. But like, what would you say to people who, who do get complacent? I mean, it's, it's one of those things of, it, it can happen to anybody, it can happen to me, it can happen to you, mm -hmm. right? One, just, you have to constantly get yourself into a state of discipline, mm -hmm. right? Discipline with your prayer, discipline with your scripture reading, studying, really pursuing it like a relationship. One of the things that we tend to do is we tie that pursuit with feeling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I'm feeling good, so I am good. I'm feeling bad, so I need to seek. And it's really, it's just a matter of just, just doing it. It's, I talked to some of my buddies, right? Uh, I, I've been dipping for this long and I'm struggling to quit and this and that. It's like, how do you quit? You, you just do it. You just do it. You will yourself to do it. You make your body do what it doesn't want to do. It's just like when I had a 120 pound ruck on my back and it's the middle of winter and it's raining on me in, the, in Robin Sage. How do you do it? You just, you just do it. Right. And not to sound harsh or like, oh, it's it's not easy. Right. Paul says um, how there's this war within his flesh. Right. My flesh is willing. My spirit is weak and all those things. This, he sees this war going on in his members. But what it comes down to is you just have to make the choice. You make the choice to do it and then you discipline yourself to do it. Paul says, I train my body and beat it into subjection. So that after I preach to others, I myself am not disqualified. And so Paul says, I make choices. I do things that are not necessarily what I want to do, 
but I make my body do what I know it needs to do. I make myself do what I know I need to do because there's a, a, an understanding that everything I do here affects eternity. And I guess that's a, one way that really drives me and that I stay motivated in this is the, re, the understanding that obviously, as James says, this life is but a vapor, right? It's here, it's gone. But what I do here is going to have an eternal effect on my inheritance. You know, that's 1 Corinthians 3, the Christian judgment. We're all going to stand before Christ, and we're going to have a pile before every single one of us. When fire gets put to that, what remains? And then, am I going to have any crowns to throw before the king? And then in Luke 19, I believe it's Luke 19, with the parable of the minus, each servant was given a certain amount that they were entrusted to do something with, right? Mm -hmm. But we had the ruler, who was Jesus. We had the citizens of the country who hated him, that's Israel. We have his servants. That would be the church. So he goes away. He comes back. What do we have? Those that were faithful to what they were given are your responsibility for ten cities. So as you study this whole thing of, of the Messianic kingdom, when Christ comes back to rule on the earth, our placement in the kingdom and our responsibilities are going to be based on what we did for him. And that's a really weird concept to think about, but when you actually put into perspective constantly, like, everything I do is going to have an eternal ramification for me. Maybe not for my salvation, but for my inheritance, my rewards, my placement in the kingdom. That really will put a motivator on you. Because you um, then the book of Hebrews is kind of like that. Uh, it, a real good study. Um, Chuck Missler does a really good study on that. Um, Arnold Fruchtenbaum. But Chuck Missler's study in Hebrews is free on YouTube. And it is solid. But... Uh, when I first was studying through Hebrews, he pointed out something I'd completely missed when studying through the book. He's in the he, book of Hebrews, he is the writer who you can pretty much make a good case that it's Paul. Um, the early church fathers believed it was Paul, hence why they, and that's why they brought it in. It was considered part of the canon. Um, because one of the requirements to be scripture, considered scripture was it had to be a first uh, an apostle or a close associate and it had to be written in the first century. Um, but when it comes to the book of Hebrews, it's speaking to Jewish believers who are looking to go back to, under Judaism to avoid persecution. But the author is basically warning them. So there's multiple warnings in the book, but one of the things it's doing is putting a focus on the eternal inheritance. The, the, you look, you're gonna not just look to die in the 70 AD judgment if you do this, you're also looking to the loss of rewards because as he does this, what he does is he methodically goes over all the major pillars of Judaism, angels, Moses, the law, the covenant, and how Jesus is better in every way than all of these things. Well, after chapter one, he starts chapter two, and he gives a warning about drifting away from the salvation. And he says, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, right? And then he says afterwards, for he has not subjected the world to come to angels of which we speak. So what he's saying is everything he's been talking about, the salvation he's been talking about is the world to come. That's what he's been talking about. And it completely changes the entire context of what he's saying. He's not talking about justification, being saved from our sins and stamped innocent before Christ and brought in a relationship with God. He's giving us warning of, Hey, we are not going to escape if we neglect the salvation that's to come, the future salvation, the glorification, where we receive inheritance and rewards. And so his whole premise in the book of Hebrews is getting them to get that mindset of, you need to look at the next life, at eternity, at the kingdom, and your inheritance and rewards, and what's going to happen if you just completely ignore that. And so it puts all of that future, that everything that you do here and now, is going to affect that. Because when you do that, and that's constantly before your mind, what's you going to do, Right? I'm going for my Green Beret. I'm trying to graduate the Q course. I'm, so I make decisions and I do things in such a way so that I don't screw that up. That's always before my mind, right? I don't want a DUI. I don't want to do well on my, I don't want to do uh, poorly in my patrols. I want to pay attention. I don't want to screw up my MOS phase. I want, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everything I do within the course is because I've got the graduation and then what's going to come after in my mind the whole time. So I suck that up and I do what I need to do. I think C.S. Lewis does a really good job in Mere Christianity of kind of 
getting after this point with thinking how to think about eternity and how God looks at us and how he it's not about like doing the right thing versus doing the wrong thing based off different contexts. It's a base it's about your character. Yeah. And God is going to look at your character. So if you know that something was the right thing to do and you decided not to do it, even if maybe you didn't do something bad, that's still like a dark mark on your character and everything is just about your character as a person and this is why like sometimes people will ask christians when they're trying to kind of trap them um with like ideology and theology is they'll say well people that aren't christians does that mean that they're going to hell like people before jesus it's like well God's going to, first and foremost, look at your character. Did you have access to the word and did you reject it? Or were you never told about it, right? So um, I think C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, great read. Uh, I'm sure you've read it. (laughs) Great read for anyone um, looking to learn about just the basic uh, fundamentals or theology of Christianity. Yeah. Well, in Romans 1 deals with that, right? Romans 1, basically the creation... Is enough to condemn them. It's not that men have not heard, it's that they've heard enough already. For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful. But be, um, and then, ah, oh, darn it. I've got the Bible up. I got the Bible up. Yeah. <laughs> um, but starting in verse 18, uh, for his invisible attributes, oh, that's wrong version. Hang on a second, my bad. Okay. Um, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So basically it's saying, look, the creation itself is enough to attest to the fact that there is a God. Walter Martin uh, said it best, and he said, if a headhunter in the Amazon you know, sees his reflection and he says, I didn't make this, I didn't make myself, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are, but help me. God, I I believe fully that heart is contrite. I think it's in the right place. I think he's seeking, and I think God will answer that, right? Um, In Matthew, when Jesus says, they ask him, why do you speak to them in parables, right? Well, some people will say, oh, it's the parables are actually made, you know, said so we can understand things better. Well, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says he speaks in parables so they don't understand it. He says to him, uh, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given. For him who does not have, for him who has, more will be given. To him who does not have what he has will be taken away. So everybody gets a certain amount of light. Everybody gets a certain amount of truth. What we do with that truth depends on if we get more or not. If we reject what God gives us, he's not bound. He does, there's nothing requiring him to give us more. Now usually he does, and you know if we actually look at people's lives, even those that are very far from God, and you talk to them, you'll actually, once you break it down, you actually find a lot of different ways that God speaks to them and gives them opportunities and gives them truth and gives them light. He'll send them people into their lives. He'll send, but I mean, even in the Middle East, there are multiple, especially within the last, um, about, I think, 15, 20 years, um, it's been pretty interesting. Uh, the testimonies of Muslims that have come out saying, hey, I was a Muslim and I was seeking truth. I had no way to get a Bible. I know it. And, and Jesus appeared to me in a dream and spoke to me and they became Christians and gave their life to Christ based on that that visitation you know and so I'm one of those like one how many people when they say they're seeking truth are really objectively seeking truth right you'll have those conversations and a lot of times when you really get down to it they, they don't they don't, they'll hear it and they'll say they're seeking but when you actually give objective facts they don't really want it how, how should people seek I think one of the things that we've talked about before on the show is setting that discipline and setting a time every morning for prayer or for reading the Bible. What are some other things that people can do to really start seeking and, like we talked about earlier, just committing themselves to spending yeah. time with God every day? I mean, obviously, you know, time of prayer, worship. Um, Nancy, Nancy Missler has a really good book called Private Worship, Keys to Joy. And that book is basically demonstrating, hey, there is, there is a difference between worship and praise. And those are two different words. One, praise, obviously, I'm, I'm praising God, I'm speaking of Him, His attributes, who He is, thanking Him, all those things. But 
Worship is more of, of a surrender. It's an internal bowing down. It's a prostration of yourself to him. In, and then when you worship, I mean, it can be silent. It, it, there's so many ways that worship actually takes, actually takes place. And I love her approach on that uh, in that book. Um, one way I, I definitely push and recommend is fasting and prayer. I mean, fasting and prayer is a massive thing um, that is missed and ignored many, many times. But it is a, it, it's a practice. Jesus says, uh, when they ask, you know, why do your disciples not fast, but John's fast? He says, well, they can't, they can't mourn while the bridegroom is here, right? But when he leaves, then they will fast. So he says, then they will fast. So there's an idea like, hey, um, we are expected to fast when he leaves. Um, there's an expectation that his followers are going to fast. And fasting is, uh, John Piper wrote a book, I believe it was called Hunger for God. Um, I, I've listened to some of it, and it, it was really good, um, the, the bit I heard. But from the studying I've done on fasting and, and listening to him and some other people, D.L. Moody talks about some of these things. Um, basically, the, when it comes down to it, we weaken the physical man to strengthen the spiritual. And what's very really interesting, that's... Jesus, 40 days in the desert. Yeah, man, right? right? <laughs> now, I, I, would not, I would not recommend going 40 <laughs> days. Um, but, but, you know, a couple-day fast is phenomenal. A, uh, a week fast is phenomenal. Obviously, people tend to break themselves into it over time. But one of the things that is amazing when you fast and pray, because if you're just fasting, right, you're just, you're just getting yourself into autophagy, you're just you know, doing some things for your, for your health, whatever you are missing out on so many, you're just starving yourself basically. Yes, there's health benefits, but spiritually you're missing out on so much. Well, so the fitness industry is all in on fasting for like oh, the last yeah. five years with intermittent fasting and fasting for the health benefits with cell autophagy, which only happens over 30, after 36 hours. So if you're doing mini fasts before that, you're not reaping those health benefits. Right. Um, but fasting is something that was done throughout religions all across the yes. world for yes. thousands of years and there's a, more of a spiritual benefit to that than a health benefit and Very i think people so. people miss that a lot in our secular society today people look towards old wisdom and they take they try to take it but attach something new to it yeah. and they wind up trying to take this old wisdom but they get the wrong thing out of it well and like I said, it, it weakens the physical to strengthen the spiritual. And it's amazing what quiets down when you're fasting. And there's so many people that struggle with so many different things, right? Pornography, drugs, coke, nicotine, alcohol, whatever, right? Anger issues, mm. blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> and, nicotine guy over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just got to do it though. You just, right? just got to just just myself. I was at one point, it. I was up to a can and a half a day. Like, yeah. and I was overseas. Plus all the caffeine I was drinking, like, and I know guys that were doing that much or more, and like, and I just cold turkey it. Mm. You just make the decision to do it. You know mm. what I mean? Nick and I have talked yeah, about that before the... too. We both prefer to cold turkey our caffeine and nicotine rather than taper. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, because because it is true. Like, I choose to put this in in my mouth. Like, I physically do it. You know, yeah. I could just not do it. And yeah, it, it's but yeah. There's like yeah. that mental. Block, but I just gotta. I, do I, it. I want it. I, I yeah, want it. Right, exactly. yeah. I, I'm like a little kid. Like, oh, I want it. Yeah. Like, it just, it's hard. You know, it's like, come on. Mm. Yeah. It is hard. Mm. So just, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things like we'll push ourselves in the gym, we'll kill ourselves in the gym, and we'll push ourselves in the through that. But I'm, mm. I can't push myself through not putting the freaking Copenhagen in my, la my lip. Mm. You know what I mean? It, it's just, man, I. Have to question my manhood now. You know right. what I mean? No, yeah. <laughs> being, being, being like addicted to a substance is just yeah. It just makes you feel like you're less of a man. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. And, well, and now it's obviously there's tricks you can do with that. Um, where I know that if you go to like, the sauna and do like a crazy sauna or a hardcore sweat or whatever, it, like it gets the stuff out of your system mm -hmm. a lot faster. But when it comes to fasting and prayer. Um, a lot of things just quiet down because your body's going into that mode where, hey, I want to eat. And then after three days, you you don't really get hungry anymore. It's interesting. It's more of a, it's the psychological, hey, I want to put a dip on my mouth and just chill because, hey, it passes the time and it gives me something kind of to do. And it's more that mental thing. It's not that my body, my body is not, a, it's not a need, but psychologically, I'm so used to doing it. Like I'm thinking, oh, hey, I need to do this, even though I'm not feeling hungry. And if you do get hungry, you just sip on some warm water. 
Um, but but what's really interesting with that is even even reactions, like things that seem to not to like when I've done it and when I was dealing with my anger, um, aside from like EMDR and some things like that for, for the PTSD, which helped a ton, um, but my anger really slowed down a lot, a whole lot. And I, I found I was able to respond rather than react. And it was probably just not having the energy. Uh, you, but what's interesting is once you hit day four, you have this real massive spike of energy. What have you day done? four. What is the longest fast you've done? Uh, ten, <laughs> 10 days. 10 days. Wow. Yeah. What about you, Nick? Have you, but, have you ever tried fasting? Longest I've gone, I think, is prob probably like 36 hours or so. Yeah. That's my I did it. I did it once and I did like 36 hours we're talking about. Yeah, with food, like well, only water. So um, so in, in, in my defense and not to say, hey, I'm some awesome dude, like my wife had just got diagnosed with cancer and, and I, it was interesting because it was, it was really interesting how God ran this whole thing out because um, I, it was Christmas time, we were at her parents' house and I just really felt, I don't want to be close to you, I, just, I want to be closer to you and I just, what can I do, is there some way? And this little PDF popped up on my computer um, from 1949, and it was called Fasting at Tonic Power with God. And it was this dude that had written on fasting back in the 40s. And I read it. It was really, really cool. I was like, okay, I, I'm gonna, I want to do this. I want to try this. And I tried one or two little ones, and I, I'd never fasted before other than the Q course where you're not eating like a seer school or whatever. And so like, well, you don't really care then because you're just so exhausted and miserable all the time anyway. Like, oh, whatever. But when I was actually in that comfort, it was really hard. I, I, I was like, I want to try to fast a day. And I, I could barely get through a day. Mm -hmm. It's like, and then they order like pizza or something. I'd be like, ah, take it to the face. Um, but then um, I was just really seeking and I made a decision. I was like, I'm, I'm really going to do a fast. It was just crazy leading into that is right before I started it, my wife got diagnosed with leukemia and it was like, okay, I, I need to do this. And then I fasted again during, during, uh, when we were at MD Anderson for about nine days and it was just, but it was, it was so phenomenal. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. It was, it was, it's crazy because it's, it's like you can throw yourself into your prayers and we in the worship to such a greater extent. And unless you actually experience it, I, I can't, you can't even describe it. it there's a closeness that you, that you get that is just incredible. And you know, Jesus says this kind comes not out by prayer, but by prayer and fasting. And I find it interesting that you know, with the algae. Okay, yeah, yeah I was going to get into this. Yeah, yeah. So, so is that Matthew twenty one where it's taken out? Right? Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing, right? and this will get a little bit into textual criticism. And for anybody that there, there's a whole world of what's the best Greek text, and there's this whole study and scholarship that goes into this, right? It is a source of unending frustration for me. Not that I'm mm -hmm. the dude with all the answers and not that I've arrived, but I'm definitely one that I, I look at the evidence, I look at what you say, I look at the external evidence, the internal evidence, all that stuff. It's not that difficult. So um, when these two guys named Westcott and Hort, they, you had the Texas Receptus, which was what the King James was built on um, and then you have the Byzantine the majority text and that's the majority of Greek documents um, that we have and they all kind of agree mostly then you have the minority text the Alexandrian codices which are two Greek texts and a couple of others right well these guys basically had a big hand in scholarship and B.B. Warfield was a major player within the Christian uh, scholarship and community and he liked what they had to say. So he really started pushing um, the Alexandrian codices. Now, there's a lot of external evidence that the and the Alexandrian documents are the ones missing all the verses. Before we continue, we should people might not know what we're talking about. So there's a verse that is not in, it's been taken out of a lot of Bibles. Yeah. Um, and it's about prayer and fasting. Do you know the verse yeah. off the top? I, of I'd have to look it up. Um, but like Acts eight thirty seven, uh, the perverse line. Well, it'll say uh, this kind come not out by prayer and fasting. They might leave off and fasting. Mm -hmm. um, but the ESV does it. The ESV goes with the, these texts and their readings. Um, but the New King James, the King James, the NASB, I believe, does have all those verses. But in these Greek documents, um, they're missing multiple verses. 
they are missing the last 12 verses of Mark, and even though there's space for them, uh, the, the problem is that these are some of the oldest documents we have. And Westcott and Hort, when you read the rules for gauging whether or not the Greek is correct or the best reading in the Greek, their number one rule pretty much was, if it's older, it's the best. Well, that's insane, right? Because just because something's old doesn't give it legitimacy, mm -hmm. right? Um, externally, uh, the Byzantine text, the majority text readings, they found those readings and those versions in Alexandria. They have not found any Alexandrian readings anywhere else in the world. And for a while, one of the things that we have to understand is that the Arians, those that didn't believe in the Trinity, and the Gnostics had, had a major, were major players within um, the Christian world and influence. And Alexandria was one of those core places for the Gnostics. Um, that's why, so if you read um, ESV, John 1.18, um, talking about the Son being in the bosom of the Father, the ESV actually uses, I think it's, I'd have to go back and look, but I think it's Valentini Valentinius, who was a, a major Gnostic. It has basically his reading of that text, and the Jehovah's Witnesses love that version. Um, now, I will say, though, that major doctrines are not changed. Right? Yeah, so like, that, that's, that's one of the things that, that people need to understand, that major doctrines are not changed in, in these. You know, there, there's not tons of difference, but there are some missing verses. And the early church, and here's, here's the big evidence, right? The early church fathers who predate the, uh, the Alexandrian codices that don't have these verses, they quote these. And so I, I, I say it's a frustration for me because you have biblical scholars or, and textual critics that'll say there's no evidence for these readings prior to the you know, 10th century or whatever. But it's like, but then you read the early church fathers that predate the best, oldest and best documents and they quote the verses that supposedly aren't there. It's like, well, well, come on, like, obviously, clearly they're there, right? In the earliest translations, they're there. But this um, gets into the conversation of the translating of the Bible, because some critics of Christianity will say it's like just people's translations of translations of translations. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's not really a fair representation, like 99.97% no. of it accurately translated. And... Nick and I did an episode on the book of Proverbs. We yeah. went through the entire book of Proverbs, and we talked about verses from each chapter. We were using different Bibles. So I was, let's see, the Bible Alex gave me, I think, is, uh, it's not my normal King James. It's one of the standard versions. And then you were using a Good News Good version. News translation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our when we read the verses, we could read the same verse and they would sound different, but they were saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if you have anything you want to say to people that might be questioning how um, how the Bible is translated from Hebrew to Greek to English, what is lost or what isn't lost, how accurate the translations are, if you have any like... Well, I mean, they're, they're, they're pretty accurate and they've been maintained for, for centuries. Yeah. I mean, again, we look at the early church fathers and their writings on the scripture and quoting scripture and you've got basically the same thing today, you know? Um, and people will, there's obviously those that'll say, and within the textual criticism, as you study that, one of the things that you realize is, and they go into very, very early on, is they're, one of the major things that people argue against the text is, oh, well, this document, uh, it contradicts this, they're not the same, there's errors, right? And so there's differences. Well, any difference they would call an error or call a contradiction, whatever term they want to use. The problem with that is Greek is not like English, yeah. right? It, it's, Greek is incredibly specific. It, it, well, and, it, and it's like Arabic, right? So I can say Ted hit Nick multiple ways in Arabic mm -hmm. because word order doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Suffixes and prefixes determine direct object, object, noun, su uh, subject, all that stuff, right? Greek's the same way. So I can say a sentence, change the word order around to an, ex to an extent, obviously, um, and as long, but it's the, it's the suffixes right. and mm -hmm. it's those that affect who is the subject, who is the object, who is the indirect object. So this, this translation might have it in one order. This, or this one Greek document might have it in this order. This Greek doc document might have it in a, diff a different word order, but it's literally saying the exact same thing because it doesn't matter, but they would still consider that 
a difference, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, error or whatever. I can't remember what, uh, what uh, term that they used. Um, but I mean, the, the translation um, is, is pretty darn good. Now, when you get into the translations, obviously you have um, the two spectrums. One's more formal, one's more uh, exact equivalent, and one's more dynamic. And that would be your, like the Message Bible, your paraphrases. I'm not a fan of them. You know, I, Walter Martin, I think he said, you, you would paraphrase God, you know? And, 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 and I think that there, there's a benefit when you're trying to get some of the ideas, but in a sense, they're kind of already interpreted, and, and there's, there's that exactness that can be lost sometimes. And so I'm, I'm a big fan of, you know, the, the New King James, um, the NASB. Um, I, I don't like the NESB. There, I have my own reasons for that, but um, beyond just the missing verses, but... Um, when it comes to, but again, major doctrine is not lost, right? They, they all pretty much say the exact same thing for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so I always recommend get, get a good translation. Don't get a paraphrase. There's just, there's just too many details that can be missed and that's left out in a sense. And a, a branch off that is another thing that uh, people that criticize Christianity might say is they might talk about how the Gospels say different things. Which I think is ridiculous if you've actually read it, because they're all saying the same thing. But it's like, if Nick and you and I are all um, witnessing an event, and we're all standing in different places and with different people at that event, we're going to tell the story slightly different from different points of view. Right. Which shows that they didn't come together and... Bring, you know, create the story because otherwise they would line up exactly. Yeah. Um, second, um, the thing is with that, and there's a series by Arnold Forkenbaum. It's there's a four part series. Then there's an abridged version, and I would recommend. I would highly, highly recommend everybody read this book, and it or at least get the audio book. You can get it on Ariel.org. It's called Yeshua: The Life of the Messiah from a Messianic Jewish Perspective. Why? Because. The Gospels were written by first century Jews. First century Jews have a form of writing. They have forms of logic. And so as you read the scriptures, as you are the Gospels, things happen the way they happen. They're said the way they are said. And events occur the way they occur because it's in a first century Jewish context. And the problem is we tend to approach it from a Greco-Roman context. Even in school, that's how they'll study the Gospels. But it didn't happen in a Greco-Roman context. It happened in a first century Israel context. And so when you have an understanding of what's actually going on, it adds so much context to just so much. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal. So, for example, um, when it's talking about uh, if you know if you break the law, uh, you say this is korban, right, whatever, and it's dedicated to God. Well, basically, under first century Judaism, they had said, you know, on your father and your mother, right? That's, that's under the law. You're supposed to take care of your parents. That was kind of like how it came into. Uh, well, what they would do is they'd say, well, everything of mine is dedicated to God. Well, that's how they would get around having to financially take care of the parents. And so by their tradition, they were uh, basically undermining the law of Moses. And this goes back to, and this is what I love about this series, um, I don't remember if it goes in the abridged version as much, but in the four-part volume. So uh, when Ezra came back from, when they came back from Babylon, Ezra started the school of the Sophrim. And what he did was basically they recognized, hey, we disobeyed the law. We did not keep the Sabbath years. The land did not give the land rest. We did not honor God. We didn't follow the law. So we're going to really go and we're going to raise up these people and they're going to teach the people the law. Right? So, we, so this doesn't happen again. Well, once that first generation died out, what they did is they started to build a wall around the law. So they started to, through their logic, think, how could this be broken, right? So, for example, don't see the, the uh, text, don't boil or see the kid in its mother's milk, right? So don't take a baby goat and boil it in its mother's milk. So they would think, okay, how could we do this? Well, by the first century, what it, it was most likely a Canaanite practice in their worship, but what happened was they would say, okay, you cannot eat meat and dairy within four hours of each other because that meat 
or that, that milk, the dairy you get, might have been from the mother of the meat that you ate. Therefore, you seethed the baby in your, you seethed it in its mother's milk in your gut. Then they also had two sets of dishes, one for meat, one for cheese. Well, here's the point. By the first century, that law actually had the same authority as the law of Moses. Because instead of saying, yes, Ezra raised up the school of the suffering, we developed these traditions so that we don't break the law, what they basically said is, when Moses came down from the mountain, he had two laws. He had the written law, and he had the oral law. And he passed the oral law to Joshua, who passed it on to the judges, who passed it on to the prophets, who passed it on to us. And they were actually to a point where they were allowed to usurp the law of Moses by their traditions were allowed to do that. So you basically were looking at a first century Jewish cult where their traditions, they had given divine authority. And so that's what Jesus, that's where Jesus is walking into. And he's, that's why a lot of the tensions going on, if you understand Pharisaic Judaism and all the traditions and everything that they had been doing and how they were ignoring the law of Moses for their own traditions, and this is you break the law for your traditions, they were claiming divine authority for their traditions. And so that's why there's so much tension going on between Jesus and the Pharisees. Um, I, I didn't really understand um, that point very well until I watched The Chosen. I'm not sure yeah. you've seen it. Yeah. It depicts that really well because I think sometimes if you're reading the Bible, you miss out on like that illustration because you're yeah. you're reading, but you miss out on some of like how that interaction might have looked. Whereas I feel like The Chosen depicts that yeah. tension between Jesus and the Pharisees really well, and you start to get a better understanding for some of the context of the time. Right. Um, I would definitely recommend the show to anyone. Yeah. You can find it on um, Angel Studios. You can just get it for free. I think you can just put it on your smart TV. So. But, but to go back to your point on the Gospels, it, it, what I love about that book is it gets rid of all the supposed contradictions. Because one, it provides context for why things are occurring in the, in the, in the Gospels. What's being said, why it's being said certain ways to certain people. And what's interesting is when you look at that context, understanding it from the Jewish framework, it removes the contradictions. When you understand the audience they're writing to, it removes the contradictions because the authors are writing with a point in mind, using the, the methods of rabbinic writing. Um, the, the four volume series he actually has, it, it's, it's massive. He, he'll say, look, this is this type of rabbinic writing. This is this type of rabbinic thought. And then he'll actually give examples from rabbinic writings. Um, and so, the contradictions, all of that stuff kind of tend to go away when you, like you said, understand it's people giving their own perspective, but two, understanding why they wrote what they did in that first century Jewish framework. So I would highly recommend that book to anybody. Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to, you want to talk about? I feel like this has been a lot for... Um, people, our audience that we generally, we have a very diverse audience, but our main demographic is like 18 to 25 year old males, just young men. Yeah. Um, our five Fs are faith, fitness, finances, family, and freedom. Yeah. Um, maybe real quick for them, because you talking, if anyone talks to you or listens to you, it's obvious you have this huge grasp and knowledge about the Bible, the way you're able to pull verses out of your head. Um, how can people learn more? Because we've talked before about, uh, we did an episode on like planting 10 trees based off the ancient Chinese proverb, mm -hmm. best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, second best time is now. And we did planting trees essentially yeah. for each of the five F's. And Nick and I were talking about how my tree to plant would be to start reading the Bible. And what was yours? Do you remember? I think it was just to start going start to church, church. week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so like an easier starting point for people, right? So um, to a lot of our young men, trying to sit down and read an 1100 page Bible is a very right. daunting task and it takes a long time. Are there any, obviously you need to read the Bible if you're gonna be a Christian and get a full understanding. Are there other good sources that people can kind of get their toes wet with? We mentioned Mere Christianity, by yeah. says Lewis, short, easy book to kind of get into the theology of Christian thought. So the way I run it, and cause I actually built like a shell of a course that was, it's made and anybody can pick it up and use it. And it doesn't require me to be there. Right. Um, cause again, that model, right. Of developing. So, um, I've got, you don't have to get my book, obviously. 
And if somebody wants my book and you don't want to pay for it, just email me, paul at thewarriorsrising.com and just say, hey, I'd like a copy of your book and I'll send you a PDF. Um, but really, you don't even need that, right? Just understand you as a Christian are called to evangelize. You are called to disciple. So one of the things that I, uh, I do is I run people through first, okay, you are called to this. You know, can you, can you explain the gospel? Can you define the gospel biblically? right? And a lot of people can't. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, um, the gospel that I received, I shared with you, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he rose the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So here we have the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But then he says, according to the scriptures. Well, at that time, the scriptures were the Old Testament. So you're dealing with the Old Testament prophecies, right? And so the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Then how is one saved? Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. John 20, 31, these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing you have life in his name, right? And so the idea is understand just the very basic message of the gospel. Can you share that? Then... Look up the prophecies of the Messiah. Get to know them. Get to know them intimately. Psalm 22, Daniel 9, 25, uh, 24 through 27. Zechariah 9, 9, Zechariah 11, 12. There's Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, exactly. You know, and I also have a PowerPoint with explaining all of this stuff. I have a uh, teaching on my podcast. I did, I have a PowerPoint on the dating of the crucifixion because you can lock it down to one, like one year. Like, and, but you get familiar with those. Um, if you're looking for, and then basically what I do is I run people through Chuck Missler's Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. And if you want to start anywhere, just start there. Go to YouTube. It's free. Chuck Missler, Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. It's a macro. It's a high level, just summary of the entire Bible. You can and even if you don't agree with everything that he says, right? because I've, I've watched it per your recommendation, and I didn't agree with everything he said, Yeah, but that's okay. And I think that's a bigger issue within Christianity right now that people get caught up on the little things. Yeah. But you'll gain a really good, like, grasp macroscopic bird's eye view yeah. of You're going to get a grasp of the whole. You're going to be able to navigate it. You'll understand what's actually going on. Now, um, so I would recommend, if you, don't, if, if you don't do anything, at least go to YouTube and start watching Chuck Missler's Learn the Bible in 24 Hours. Um, because again, that's a place to start. Start from the macro, high level perspective, slowly work your way down, and then start working and chunking, chunking away. Just do little bits of studies of books. You know, the, the, the thing that we tend Nick, to- Nick was listening to something similar on Spotify. I think it was what it was called. Bible of the Year. Bible of the yeah. Year, yeah. yeah. Okay, that, is that by the, the Catholic? Father Mike Father Schmitz. Mike, yeah, 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 yeah. I, got, I yeah. got through Genesis. I, I have to pick it back up again. Yeah, but- <laughs> so. Yeah. The big, and, and here's one of the things too, right? Time allocation. Most of us don't realize how much time we waste. Mm -hmm. The average American adult spends two and a half, three hours a day, up to five, but the average, yeah. two and a half, three hours a day on social media. It takes 70 hours to read through the Bible average. That means that if you were to take that time, instead of freaking wasting your dopamine on social media and just, just read the Bible, you could get through the Bible once every month. And you'd be a lot more satisfied. <laughs> and you'd be a lot more satisfied, exactly. Now, obviously, that's going to be a chore, right? That's going to be a bit much. But what you can do is just sit down and say, hey, I'm going to watch a teaching, right? I'm going to go through, get a commentary, whatever. I'm just going to study this book. I'm going to start studying. I'm, going to, I'm going to just going to do five verses, right? One of the things, though, is that as you start to learn, it gets exciting. That's that's why when I was coming back from Afghanistan, and we, I, I was not living like I needed to back then. Um, I was a Christian, but I was very, you know, very, very, very lukewarm. And we got stuck coming back for like three weeks. And my medic was like, "Hey, have you ever have you ever listened to Chuck Missler's Living Battle Twenty Four Hours?" And I was like, eh, "No." And we were playing Battle Toads on the emulator. And so we just sat there and listened to it. And I, I cannot say how many times I said, no way, no freaking way. Because just all the stuff he was pointing out in the text, all, again, goes back to the details. 
the details that are within the text are just so mind-blowing and so cool that it's like you start to get excited about it, you know, because it's discoveries. That, that it's like I'm, I'm seeing this like it's brand new. I, it's not that boring stuff anymore. There's a hunger for it. Um, Jordan Peterson has put up a picture of all the cross references yep. in the Bible before, and yeah. it's got like 65,000 cross references yep. between different verses between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yeah. Um, and I think he called it the world's first hyperlinked website. Is yes. The Bible. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's, you know, it goes back to discipline on anything. Like a lot of us, like we'll sit there. It's, it's too easy. We're so addicted, addicted to our dopamine. You know what I mean? And our distractions, our video games and, and fun and all that stuff. Like it's, it, goes, it goes back to that discipline of, am I going to sit and actually spend time in this? You know? And so you just have to kind of make yourself, but, and that's why I love Chuck Mr. Zill in the Bible 24 hours, because it's like, Oh, this makes sense now. I understand. I see how it's all connected. I see the flow of thought. I see it's one integrated message. It's not, yes, there's multiple books, but it is one message from one God. Yeah, that's a really great start for people. Nick, did you have anything else to add? No, but but I'm definitely going to listen to the Chuck Missler's Learn a Bible in 24 Hours. It, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. All right. If you guys uh, really enjoyed this episode, if you learned from Paul, Paul, where can people find you? You mentioned your podcast, Warriors Rising. Yep, so I have a podcast, Warriors Rising. I've got a TikTok channel, uh, TikTok Theologic. Uh, you can reach out to me, Paul, at warriorsrising.com. I mean, I, I usually answer everybody that messages me because I ain't, I ain't famous. <laughs> uh, but um, So that's different ways uh, people can reach out. Uh, we do have this thing called Make Heaven Crowded Kits on uh, makeheavencrowded.us, my uh, co-host, I guess you could say, Tiana, she and I, uh, she, uh, myself, and some other people put together these kits, and it's it's ba basically, there's pretty much no profit built into it. We tried to get everything as um, inexpensive as possible. It's $20. You get three books. Uh, you get my book. You get CPR, which is a biblical guide to soul winning, which is a written by a cop and his wife out of East Tennessee, and it's just basically hey, how do you actually share the gospel? And they actually leave lots of blanks, and it's kind of set up like a how-to, step-by-step, where you fill your stuff in, to give you just, hey, this is how you can just share the gospel. And go. how do you go from a natural conversation to a spiritual conversation? And then the third book is Charlie Campbell's answer, uh, 50 Answers for Skeptics, or something like that. I can't, I'd have to go back and look. And basically, it's answers to the top 50 questions that skeptics usually ask. Um, and then there's Make Heaven Crowded stickers, and then a... QR uh, code, um, also on another one that's got uh, ChristianityIsTrue.com that takes people there to hear, to see evidence for faith, evidence for the Bible, uh, evidence for Jesus. And so all of that together is, is $20. And because we just want to see people equipped, so that's makeheavencrowded.us. That's great. Um, so if you want to hear more from Paul, go to one of those resources. And then last thing before we head out here today, we usually start the episode with a shout out, but we forgot to do that today. So, uh, Paul, is there anyone that you would like to shout out for this episode? Uh, probably my wife for letting me come over and all over here on a Saturday. <laughs> Just let me do have all the time it's, to do the it's things. It's two thirty on a Saturday, right? Yeah, now. <laughs> yeah. But all, 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 all the, all the man. She's just, she's amazing, and then. The amount that she lets me just go and do what I need to do is, and the way she supports me in that and just takes care of everything is just phenomenal. So definitely massive shout out to her on that. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us today at Weights and Wealth. And don't forget to apply today's lessons to live healthy and wealthy. If this conversation will contribute to your fitness and financial gains, please share it with a friend or family member give a five-star review so more people can lift bigger weights and get bigger bank accounts.